because we are already a little bit late. So next speaker is Mike Brockhurst, and the title is exactly the same as before, Plasmid-Mediated Horizontal Gene Transfer in Microbiomes. Great, thank Mike. you. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. Um, just to pick up Connie's question, yes, we have measured fitness costs on the rhizosphere. Yeah, the plasmids are costly, the bacteria do grow, and the compensatory mutations do compensate for costs on plant roots. So yeah, we can pick that up uh, later if you like. So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about our work uh, looking at more complex communities. So as you'll pick up throughout the talk, I collaborate a lot with Jamie um, and some of this, this, all this work is on the same system as Jamie's. And actually uh, I had to throw this talk together quite quickly, realizing what Jamie was talking about and that we were in the same session. So excuse me if this is a bit uh, rough and ready, but it allows me to talk about some new data that that we haven't published um, yet. Great, so this is just an uh, opening slide just to thank everyone involved in the work. Um, Sorry, so Mike, I'm recording. Do you want to be recorded since you are saying it's new data or do you want to stop? Uh, it's fine, it's, got, it's on bioarchive, so it's fine. Um, Ellie and Jamie really developed this system um, when they were in my lab and then uh, a few other PhD students and postdocs have, have picked up the system. And here are some other collaborators, particularly Kat Coit, who's done some modeling, which I'll talk about today. Um, okay, so I don't need to explain plasmids as being important, but you know they really are important in terms of bacterial evolution, in terms of carrying genes around and evolutionary innovation, as we all know. And we all know that plas what plasmids are, so they sit separate from the chromosome, um, they're semi-autonomous and they, they replicate themselves. So this autonomous, Nature is really interesting as an evolutionary um, as, as, as an evolutionary biologist because it means you can have different fitness interests between the chromosome um, and the plasmid. We can have these context dependent fitness benefits as we've heard about. So in a drug containing environment, an antibiotic resistance gene is beneficial, whereas we can think possibly about some constitutive fitness costs of plasmid carriage um, that need to be outweighed for the plasmid to be beneficial. And part of the reason why the, the conflicts of fitness interest between chromosomes and plasmids can come about is because plasmids are capable both of vertical and horizontal transmission, at least when they're mobilizable or conjugative. And I'll talk only really about conjugative plasmids today. So that means we can get different levels of selection operating in populations uh, on the plasmid versus the chromosome, giving them different evolutionary properties. Also, um, as Jamie touched upon, uh, plasmids act as vehicles for other mobile elements and so often have transposons nested within them, which themselves can have their own fitness interests, can hitch rides on plasmids. And so we can think you have this kind of Russian doll model that people have proposed in terms of understanding the interactions between mobile elements that become nested within plasmids. And I'll, I'll sort of think about those ideas a little bit as we go through. As Jamie mentioned, the system we work on are these, uh, we're isolated from this sugar beet field. Um, they isolated loads of plasmids actually. Um, and the way they captured them was by them encoding mercury resistance. And so just from the original capture of these plasmids, we see something really interesting about their evolution. So these divergent plasmids all encode basically the same transposon providing mercury resistance. And so even in the field, we know that that transposon is probably jumping around, hitching rides on different plasmids. Um, and that was revealed by this exogenous capture experiment back in the 90s by Andrew Lilly. So one thing that's interesting about the collection is that most of the plasmids are pretty big uh, and they encode a bunch of other stuff that we don't really know anything about. Um, and we focus pretty much exclusively on the mercury resistance trade. So as Jamie explained, we can measure the fitness cost of these plasmids and effectively what happens is in the absence of mercury, we see these quite large fitness costs, but variable among the plasmids. And then as you increase the amount of mercuric ions in the medium, then you can recover a fitness cost of plasmid carriage. So in this region of parameter space, we see a benefit of plasmid carriage and we expect them to be on the positive selection, at least, at least initially. Um, whereas here we have a cost and we expect the plasmids to be on the negative selection. So the first thing I'm going to sort of take you through is, is how um, the mode of transmission of plasmids varies uh, between those two conditions where you, ha you have positive selection for the plasmid encoded trait versus negative selection for the plasmid encoded trait. 
And so we can do that as a very simple experiment with a competition, essentially a mixture of strains, half of which have the plasmid, half of which don't, but they have different markers. And then we can track transfer of the plasmid over multiple rounds of growth. So the first thing we can see with that experiment, which we do across this gradient of mercury uh, selection, is that plasmids are able to spread under a broader range of selected conditions than the same genes encoded on the chromosome. So showing me on the bottom the data for the chromosomally encoded genes and on the top the data for the plasmid encoded genes across three different levels of mercury. So yellow is where there is none. And then the two blues are where we've got some mercury present. And so the chromosomal copy of mercury resistance genes spreads only in the presence of mercury. And in the absence of mercury, it just stays at 50%. Whereas um, the plasmid encoded version can spread where mercury is around and also spread to fixation where mercury isn't around. And that's due to these, this ability of plasmids to cause infectious transmission. And if we look in a bit more detail in those plasmid containing populations, so this is just showing you the six replicates here and the three different levels of mercury, um, and showing you in the lines the original donors um, shaded for plasmid carriage with the solid line and the pink, and the original recipients in the dotted line and shaded when they become transconjugates in blue, then we can see that in the absence of mercury, the plasmid essentially spreads completely through horizontal transmission. So the plasmid bearers that we see at the end are basically all transconjugates that gained the plasmid during the experiment. Whereas when we select with mercury, we see clonal expansion of the original plasmid donor. And so you move, as you move from this negative to positive selection regime, you move from a high horizontal gene transfer regime where you've got lots of infectious transmission and conjugation maintaining the plasmid into a low horizontal gene transfer regime where the plasmid essentially spreads via, via vertical transmission. Uh, and so that can be important under more complex selection regimes. So this is quite simple. We have just constant selection at different levels, um, but we can, look also at pulse selection at different frequencies of um, imposing mercury selection for those uh, mercury resistance genes. Uh, and so if you do that in populations where we've introduced uh, a different plasmid than I've just, the data I've just shown you, so in this case PQBR 103 that Jamie mentioned, which is a very large plasmid with quite a low conjugation rate, um, then just showing you some transfer experiments here where we transferred populations for 30 odd transfers. The plasmid started at 50% in the population. And when we imposed continual selection for the plasmid, it rose to high frequency and then it was sustained when we withdrew selection. So the gray is showing you when we added mercury. And that's a product of compensatory evolution here. When we had slightly uh, less frequent selection for the plasmid, we still saw this uh, robust maintenance of the plasmid. But when we didn't select for the plasmid to, to begin with, then it, it fell to very low and sometimes undetectable frequencies. But then when we imposed a pulse of mercury selection later in the experiment, then those very rare um, individuals that had the plasmid swept to high frequency um, under positive selection but then did subsequently and slowly decline. But what's interesting is that the only regime where we really saw appreciable levels of transconjugates in the experiment was this regime where we had very rare selection for the plasmid. So showing you again that when you're in a rare positive selection regime, then, or, then essentially conjugation becomes much more important and you enter a more of a high horizontal gene transfer regime. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's just sort of thinking about populations, how selection varies the mode of, of inheritance of a plasmid, and also how the frequency of selection for the plasmid alters um, relative importance of those modes of inheritance. So showing that when you have less positive selection, infectious transmission becomes more important, but also when you have even rare selection, um, infectious transmission is really important as a mode of maintaining the plasmid in the absence um, of, of, of any benefit that that plasmid encodes.
Okay, so Jamie did some really nice experiments following up that um, two species system that he talked about just now, um, where we looked at much more diverse kind of natural soil communities. Um, these were actually washes that we took from the potting soil that we use in our experiments. Um, and so I'm not going to go into much detail here, simply to say that we introduced pseudomonas fluorescence with different plasmids, and then we tried to detect those plasmids in the background community after seven days. So to do that, we used this technique called um, EPIC PCR, where essentially you make concatenated PCR products in an, in an emulsion. So the emulsion ensures that you're only doing that on single cells and you're essentially able to link a taxonomic marker to um, the 16S gene. Sorry, you link the 16S gene to a gene of interest. So 16S is your taxonomic marker and you're trying to track the plasmid. So by doing that, we were able to um, detect transmission of two of our plasmids um, into members of this community. These experiments were really hard to do um, and this technique is quite challenging. But so this top plot here is showing you the frequency of or the proportion of reads that were due to SBW25 in yellow and then in white showing you the proportion of reads in the EPIC PCR that were essentially transconjugate. So other species that had gained the plasmid and then showing you some, some kind of feel for the diversity of those other species that gain the plasmid. And so they're mostly close relatives of the pseudomonads, but we do see some surprisingly distantly related species. So we're a little bit wary about this data um, just because of the difficulties of doing epic PCR. But this is really to prove that this, these plasmids do disseminate broadly, um, even in this relatively simple soil community, although there's lots of species there, but it's a lab, a lab system that we've devised um, rather than a completely natural system. Okay, so I moved to Manchester recently and at Manchester is this person here who's called um, Kat Coit. And she has done over the last few years some amazing modeling. So she's developed a whole body of ecological theory for understanding the microbiomes, complex microbiomes. And so most of her work is focused on the human microbiome, but I persuaded her to think about our kind of simpler soil microbiome. And so what her models typically do um, is model lots of different species and then embed uh, a kind of network of interactions among those species. And so those interactions might be positive interactions shown by blue arrows here or negative interactions um, shown by the, the, red, the red bar there. So she can model complex microbiomes that have um, different levels of negative versus positive interactions in them. And then she overlaid onto that model, uh, essentially a resistance gene and that resistance gene could have different levels of mobility. Um, so it could spread within a species or it could spread between species. And so that's effectively modeling a plasmid um, in this complex microbiome model. So what we've used this model to look at um, is how plasmids affect the stability of complex microbiome communities. And so we measure stability um, essentially as the change in abundance. So, um, it's just a log of this, this value here. So abundance after exposure to an antimicrobial divided by the abundance before exposure. Um, so we can measure stability in our model. Um, we do that under a bunch of different conditions. So we do it in the absence of the resistance gene and in the presence of the resistance gene. And we have a, we either allow some mild exposure to this antimicrobial stressor prior to the um, perturbation. So you, could, you either have communities that have some mild exposure to the stress or not, and then we expose them to this very high level of the stress and we look at their stability. We then calculated two metrics. So delta R is essentially the change in stability due to a resistance gene being present in the community, whereas delta E is the uh, change in stability due to that prior selection, weak selection with the, with the stress. Um, and then we measured three different compartments of the community. So we measured stability of the entire community. We measured stability just of the background species. So these are the species 
that act as recipients for the plasmid and don't have the plasmid to begin with and don't have any resistance genes. Um, and then we also measured stability of the focal species. So that's just to explain how the model works. So what we then do is model the susceptible community, and then we model a community where we, different communities where we add resistance genes. Um, and then we have a, another parameter that, that controls the mobility of those resistance genes. So how likely are they to transmit to other cells and other species in our community? Um, and so I'm just going to show you first off a very simple model where we don't have any species interactions going on. So this is kind of an ecology free model that's just looking at the properties of the system um, when, you do, when you have different levels of mobility. Okay, so if we look first at delta R, so this is the, the increase in stability due to the resistance gene. Um, then as you increase mobility, you see an increase in total community stability and you see an increase in background community stability and basically no effects on the focal species, which already has the resistance genes. So remember, this is, this is stability here. So we're measuring the ability of them to survive this very strong perturbation. So this makes sense. As you increase mobility, the genes that provide resistance to the perturbation are more able to invade the community. And so they provide a broader stability. They're, they allow more of the species to survive the perturbation. Uh, and we can see that effect by looking at the, pro the percentage of resistant um, cells in the, the community. Um, and so, yeah, as you increase mobility, you see more and more resistance in the community. Um, and prior exposure allows the resistance genes on the plasmid to invade uh, lower levels of mobility. So they're, they're effectively driving um, driving those, those uh, plasmid-borne genes into the community at slightly lower levels of mobility. Um, and then finally, thinking about this delta E property, so this is, the, ben this is the, the change in stability due to prior exposure. And so we see that prior exposure is most important at these intermediate mobility levels. So that's effectively capturing this difference here. So where prior exposure selects for um, genes that become beneficial upon the perturbation later in, in the experiment. So they're driving these genes through at lower levels of mobility, driving them into the community at lower levels of mobility. So next, Kat took that model and she put in all of the network of species interactions. And so we can test how horizontal gene transfer by plasmids affects um, stability of different kinds of microbial communities. So she does that by changing the level, the percentage of positive interactions in the community. So over here, we've got a just a competitive community. And over here, we've got a cooperative community and you can have everything in between. Um, <clears throat> OK, so firstly, just looking at um, the, the total community. So this is the entire community. And what we're plotting here are the percentage of positive interactions in that community and then again, um, mobility of the resistance gene. Um, and so this is showing you delta R, so the, the change in stability due to the resistance gene. And you can see that in the total community, adding resistance genes is usually good. So it increases the stability of the total community. And it does so most strongly in the presence of highly mobile resistance genes in a cooperative community. Um, and in terms of delta E, we see again that in, the, the effect of prior selection is basically felt most strongly at these intermediate mobility levels. So it's more interesting when you look at the background community. So here we see um, some interesting effects of the network of interactions in the community. So as the community becomes more competitive, um, then we see that introducing resistance genes with low mobility actually destabilizes the background community. And so this is because these cells have a really, the cells that we've introduced with resistance genes have a really strong advantage when they're surviving because they can survive this perturbation. Um, they don't tend to give those resistance genes away. And so they, they experience really great competitive release when um, there's this perturbation and they're able to outcompete everything um, after the, so upon the perturbation. But where you have um, 
highly mobile resistance genes and where you have a, a more cooperative community, then you still see these strong benefits in the background community of, of introducing resistance genes, particularly when they're mobile. Um, and then we look when we look at the focal species. So this is the where we the species that originally carries the resistance genes. We see this quite interesting effect of prior selection, which is where you can see a strong cost in terms of stability for the focal species. So this is where in competitive communities there's the cost of giving your resistance genes away to other species. So essentially, you're no longer benefiting from um, the competitive release the benefit of being resistant in the absence of, of non-resistant competitors. So finally, just to wrap up, um, I know I've run out of time, but we tested this uh, idea in our experimental system. So we took a community in soil, uh, we introduced our resistance genes either on the chromosome or on two different plasmids, and then we transferred them and exposed them to a mercury perturbation with or without this weak prior selection. So what we see is that essentially adding resistance genes does improve the stability of the total community. Um, but much more interestingly, if we look at the, the background species, we can see that introducing chromosomal resistance genes strongly decreases the stability of the background community as predicted by the model. Um, whereas introducing mobile resistance genes actually increases the stability of the background community. And so as our model predicted, that's because these genes, these resistance genes, when they're mobile on plasmids, move into the background community. Um, and so if we look after, before and after the pulse, then we can see strong selection and an increase in those resistance genes in the background. And then finally, this neat little detail in the focal species, that if they give away their resistance genes because they're mobile, then we see this weakening of um, focal species stability uh, when you actually select for those genes before the perturbation. Okay, so just to sum up, infectious transmission of plasmids is really important. It enables resistance genes to survive and spread without positive selection. It increases the stability of microbiomes. Um, against perturbation by antimicrobials for when they encode resistance genes, but the precise effects of that depend on the interplay between mobility and the network of interactions in the community. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, okay. Let's see if we have questions. I don't know if Olivia wants to speak up herself or should I read the question is, I find the pattern of rare selection being associated with higher horizontal gene transfer very interesting. Do you have an explanation or hypothesis for this observation? So yes, our explanation for that is, um, in that experiment, the, the plasmid has a low conjugation rate. And in, when you don't select for it, it declines to very low frequency, but it doesn't go extinct. And the reason it doesn't go extinct is because that low level of conjugation allows it to persist in the population, even though it's costly. Um, and so it's essentially that very low level conjugation and persistence that then allows those very rare cells to reinvade um, the community when you select for the genes on the plasmid. Um, and so what's interesting is that that declined to very, very low numbers. So we couldn't even detect them when we, we were plating out neat cultures. They were so rare. Um, that, that decline essentially prevents compensatory evolution happening because the, the cells are too rare for them to acquire a compensatory mutation. Um, and so at that point, conjugation and transmission is really the only game in town for plasmids to survive um, in those situations where they're costly and they're not being selected. And so, um, yeah, the, the answer there is, is really that they persist at extremely low levels through conjugation. Um, and just, I suppose, to follow up, Dan Rankin did a model many years ago that sort of predicted that, that the very rare pulses of um, selection for plasmids could, se or selection for genes encoded on plasmids could select for their mobility. So um, that was a nice vindication of his model. Okay, we have one more question by Marco Consentino. Uh, hi, 
I very nice talk. Um, I have a question. So does your experimental system, would your experimental system allow to address the question of the reduction in diversity in a community when uh, you introduce a beneficial uh, trait uh, through a plasmid? Because this will be the subject of my talk tomorrow, but it's very theoretical. But uh, uh, okay, uh, yes, it does allow that. So. Um... So to explain the paper, the, the paper's on bioarchive, but to explain why it can test that, the, um, when we have prior selection in that system, then um, some of the slightly unexpected results to do with stability are essentially to do with um, the, the community being, all of the very, very susceptible species being selected out of that community and diversity declining. Um, in the presence of resistance genes. So yeah, that, it's a slightly convoluted explanation, but yeah, it would, we could design an experiment to explicitly look at that in a slightly more sophisticated way than, than that experiment. But, um, but yeah, it would allow that, definitely. Very interesting. So you could measure the, the amount of taxa as a function of time, for example, after you introduce a beneficial... Uh... Yeah, yeah, we, we didn't track it in enough, um, at high enough frequency to look at the rate of loss of species and things like that, but um, but it wouldn't be ch that challenging to do that. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. Thanks.